there we go. And with that, I would like to once again, uh, welcome everyone to the Los Angeles Spurters webinar for tonight. We are really excited to have Marky Mutchler with us to talk about um, bird sound, night, nighttime bird sounds. However, if uh, you're not a member of LAB, I'd like you to seriously consider becoming a member. Our membership helps support webinars just like this one. We record all our webinars and make them available to the world on our website. We also handle uh, many uh, community science projects. We, um, um, we offer and give out scholarships to young birders, Lab S students and uh, things of that nature. So we really can use your support. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to introduce Andy Birch, who will introduce uh, our speaker for tonight. Andy. Thank you, Ron. So Los Angeles Birders is very happy to have Marky Mutchler with us this evening. Marky earned her BS degree from Louisiana State University and has plans to return to graduate school. Uh, though Marky is fairly new to the Southern California area, she found her niche and inspiration in the museum collections at the Moore Lab of Zoology at Occidental College as a re research technician, where she also manages the Genomics Center. She's been spending her gap years working on the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project that focuses on resurveying the birds of Mexico to see how both the distributions and genomes of Mexican birds have changed over the last hundred years. And she was recently awarded an undergraduate student post award at this summer's Wilson Ornithological Society conference. And she's been helping to count birds during spring migration at Bear Divide. Marky is an avid birder, an excellent artist, and devotes much of her time to observing and taking notes on the birds she sees. Marky is a noted expert in nocturnal flight calls, where she is considered one of the leading North American experts. For instance, did you know it was possible to identify ducks flying overhead at night by the different sounds of their wing beats, or wing whistle as it's called? Well, Marky was one of the founders of an open source ID guide for this. She's conducted nocturnal flight call studies in Missouri and on the Gulf Coast, where she has conducted some of the most impressive nocturnal counts that number over 800 birds an hour and covering scores of different species. So we have no one better qualified to, to cover tonight's topic. Please welcome Marky Matchla. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, very excited to be here and to kind of bring a very um, Eastern centric uh, birding style to the West Coast. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And so, if some of you actually tuned in um, to previous webinars, Andy actually gave a um, very um, thorough and amazing presentation on nocturnal flight calls. Um, and so this is going to kind of be a build off of that. Um, I'll still talk about some of the basics in case you didn't catch that um, nocturnal flight call talk. Um, but yeah, this will be kind of go a little more into the nitty gritty of nocturnal flight calls, recording, and identification. And so right now it's September, it's fall, the trees are turning colors. Well, as much as they do in Southern California, most of them still stay green. Um, but a few of the sycamores are turning yellow. We have rarities showing up like this black throated green warbler um, that was just recently found. And we have a lot of warblers that are flying through, a lot of birds moving. So migration is really in full swing. Um, as this fall sneeze comic, this is a little northern perula, which granted we don't really get them that very much here. Um, but screw this, I'm going to Mexico. And so again, migration is in full swing. It's September, October. However, birds are actually always moving. Uh, migration is always happening. And so it just so happens that a lot of these different groups of birds tend to move the most during these spring and fall periods, which is why we really think of that like April and May, September, October as sort of peak migration. Um, and so 
you can still go out and experience waterfall migration in the winters and uh, shorebird migration during those really hot summer days in July and August. Um, and this kind of like constant movement of birds is really what kind of captivated me as a young birder. Um, it's not so much just about, oh, there's birds and going to see the birds, but also the fact that birds can show up anywhere during these migratory periods. So I've spent a lot of times in fields, uh, mucking around, looking at shorebirds. Um, I do counts at Bear Divide. Um, this is me holding a lazulite bunting from this past spring, we we're banding them. I've spent time on the ocean a little bit where I've watched um, our seabirds migrating too. Um, it's less so a cyclical migration and more so tied to their breeding. Um, I've walked in the Gulf of Mexico a few miles. Wasn't supposed to be that much, but I ended up walking quite a um, good amount uh, to some barrier islands for some migratory birds. And so a lot of my birding really has been built around um, this migration, this movement of birds, the unpredictability, and just that fascination um, with these birds that are driven to move these like incredible distances. Um, actually, so much so that a lot of my research that I have done as an undergraduate and just during summers has revolved around um, understanding bird migration. So this photo actually is, uh, I'm releasing a long-billed curlew that I put a tag on and we'll be able to follow this bird through its migration path. Um, and one interesting thing is, sure, we know that long-billed curlews tend to winter either in the Gulf Coast or along our coast in California. And we know that they breed in the Great Plains. However, for example, this bird that I released, um, I was banding in Eastern Montana. All of the Eastern Montana birds go to the Gulf Coast. None of them come to California. So the birds we see here in California are not the Eastern Montana birds. Um, so just this like constant movement and really understanding where birds are going, um, where they're coming from, is just something that's very fascinating to me. And one part of that is also the spectacle of migration. So let me paint a little picture for you. Maybe you're standing at Bear Divide or it's May and you're in Kern County and the sun is just rising and you start uh, to experience morning flight. Let me see if I can get the sound to work. I don't know if the sound's gonna work. Oh no. Go back. And you start to hear birds flying over you. From the little tiny calls we have in the sky, you might even be able to see some of these birds moving through. And just that spectacle of that early morning rise and like suddenly you're surrounded by birds flying overhead, that visible migration, um, I, I find quite spectacular. Um, also a little plug for Bear Divide. This is a Bear Divide view. And if you haven't been yet, I highly recommend it in spring. Um, for some people, this might be a little overwhelming uh, because you're just like so many birds flying over you. Uh, it's all happening so fast and there's so many different sounds. And I like to just kind of step back and um, for people who've never vi uh, seen this visme, as it's called, uh, to just like absorb it and take it in and not try and focus on identifying things, just kind of enjoy the spectacle. So visible daytime migration, it's a lot of fun. It's really cool, but we're here for nocturnal migration. And so while we're seeing hundreds and thousands of birds even moving during the day, there are literally thousands and millions that are moving at night. And we have birds like bitterns and rails and sandpipers, like those long-billed curlews I talked about. This isn't upland sandpiper, but long-billed curlews are moving at night too. Um, and of course, we have our nocturnal birds that we already know about that they also move at night too. So like night hawks are migrating, whippoorwills, um, poor whales are moving. And of course, pastorines like warblers and flycatchers and vireos are all moving at night. And so 
why are they moving at night? Why do we have so many birds going at night when we often think of these birds as something that we see during the daytime, they're active during the day, they sleep at night? Why are they suddenly shifting into this nocturnal migration? Um, well, there's a few different theories as to why they're doing this. Um, and it's thought that uh, it helps them move long distances at night and then spend the daytime kind of resting, refueling, and not having to move very far to kind of um, feed on insects and kind of regain their strength before they continue moving the next night. Another thing about nocturnal migration and why birds might do it is that uh, the atmosphere at night is more stable. There's cooler temperatures, reduced turbulence, so it allows even the tiniest um, kinglets even moving at night can go way up high and then keep that sustained altitude before um, coming back down. And so uh, that reduced turbulence really helps them maintain um, and reserve energy. The cooler temperatures also help them with heat loss um, in that they can expel heat and it's more energy efficient, as well as it being um, on average um, higher humidity allows them to retain water better. So again, it's just more cost of effective for these birds to move at night. And then of course, um, a lot of these birds, their predators are usually diurnal predators. There are nocturnal um, predators. Uh, even night jars are known to eat nocturnally migrating birds. Um, but in general, uh, moving at night allows them to avoid uh, those diurnal predators like hawks. So these birds do it and they do it at least twice a year. How are they doing that? How are they, these birds that we think of as like very um, sight forward species, how are they able to move in complete darkness? Um, well, there's a few different ways that birds actually um, are able to do this migration. Um, one big thing is through a star compass. So for example, here on the right, I have this quick little figure of an experiment that actually had um, these enclosures which is an open top and down at the bottom is like an ink pad. And they're like, so these birds are surrounded by kind of um, a paper funnel. And so they actually took indigo buntings, put them in these funnels and then put them in a planetarium and had the night sky oriented um, just so that it was a classic like spring night where the birds are orienting to go north. Um, and they found that with the planetarium and just the stars, the birds were able to orient north. Um, and you can see by the blotting paper that they actually um, tried to go north in this direction. They found that if they flipped the night sky during a spring period, the birds would follow that flip. So even though it was technically facing south, the planetarium sky um, told them north was the opposite way and the birds followed that. Another thing that birds use that we're kind of uncovering um, and figuring out how they do that is through geomagnetism. Um, there are several different experiments that look at uh, literally running currents through birds and seeing how they react to switching of currents and how their homing changes. Um, but basically birds are able to use the magnetic field to find the poles on the earth. Another kind of cool thing that they've recently uncovered um, is quantum mechanics and specifically more so related to quantum entanglements, um, which is basically how electrons um, kind of interact together and respond to the, um, the, the magnetic field. So it's more kind of quantum mechanics is basically just kind of under that field of geomagnetism. So these birds are literally using um, stimuli from electrons to orient themselves. And then finally, kind of a weird one is olfaction, which is sense of smell. Um, and now this mostly pertains to our seabirds, um, not so much to our passerines or rails or anything, to our knowledge. We don't know if we use olfaction, um, but the tube noses will use olfaction to kind of traverse the ocean and then come back to their exact same burrow so they know where to go. And of course, birds can use a combination of this. Um, we still have not uncovered exactly how they do all of this. Um, it's quite amazing. And so to look at this more in a nocturnal migration perspective for us, where are birds doing this? Um, there is a bit of splitting up in terms of altitude, um, but for the most part, uh, birds are moving between ground level and about 5,000 uh, feet for our purposes. And so on the left, this is an older figure, and on the right is a, a nifty website called BirdCast. And if you look at the bottom left of that right image, you'll actually see that there's an altitude graph. Um, I highly recommend this website. It's got great 
um, migration tools that anyone can use. So how do we as birders experience nocturnal migration? If it's at night, like how are we able to experience this visible migration and this amazing spectacle that's happening right over our heads? So you can participate in something called NOCVISMIG, um, Nocturnal Visible Migration. Um, it's a little bit harder than nocturnal flight calls, which I promise we're going to get to right after this. Um, so NOCVISMIG, you can participate in a few different ways. You can go the really expensive route and purchase a thermal scope for a few thousand dollars. If you see this image, um, it's kind of the yellow and pink. If you look towards the center, there's like a little like light cross shaped thing. It's a bird. Um, and there's this uh, guy who, whose name is William Powers. Um, he's actually on a Facebook group who is currently recording birds flying over with not with these thermal scopes and is able to like actually see the birds flying over his yard using thermal imaging, which is crazy cool. Another thing that some people are doing, especially out east where um, these migratory pathways are really concentrated and you get thousands of birds moving, is they're using spotlights to actually spotlight the birds and see them fly by. So I have included a little post from um, this birder named Tom Johnson, who does incredible flight photography and even manages to photograph these birds at night migrating, um, which is just incredibly cool. And then finally, the most cost-effective way to see nocturnal birds migrating um, is through moon watching. Um, this, of course, you have to have a more clear night and you have to hope for a more full moon and you have to hope that aligns with decent migration to really be able to see the birds migrating because it's such a, a small piece of sky that you're able to look at. So there are ways to see nocturnal visible migration, um, but let's go ahead and shift gears and let's paint another picture. It's nighttime, it's dark, um, maybe you're somewhere in, in downtown Los Angeles and you start to hear, oh, it's gonna do this thing again. Here it is. You start to hear a little like, is what nocturnal migration overhead can sound like. Um, depending on where you're at and the conditions, it can sound way crazier than that. It can be much reduced where you're only getting a call every few minutes. Um, but it's this amazing thing happening right over our heads. And the great thing about it is that it can happen just about anywhere. It doesn't matter if you have a big, beautiful backyard, um, if you have a pond nearby, you could live in an apartment and still experience this migration. And like I said, those are nocturnal flight calls. Um, and they kind of, they're very similar to the calls we hear during the day because they're the same flight calls. These are just happening at night. And so with nocturnal flight calls, in order to actually identify and really um, work with like understanding the migration, we need to record um, what's happening. And so on the right here is just an image, um, a quite colorful image of what nocturnal flight calls look like on um, if you were to record. And just a quick overview, we'll talk a little bit more about spectrograms in a second, but this is a spectrogram and it reads sort of like sheet music where the lower part of the image um, is lower frequencies. And the higher up you go, the higher the sound is. Um, and then on our X axis from left to right is simply in seconds. Um, so it just shows you a, time, a timeline basically. And so recording helps us with identification of these birds because as you heard in that um, quick little sound bite that these calls are very short and a lot of them sound very similar. Um, if you heard some of the higher pitch calls in that recording, um, there's probably five or six different species of warbler and there's a few buntings that are calling, but to some to an untrained ear, it sounds all very much the same. Um, and so 
having recordings is a really good way to not only learn the identification, but have a good record to help you identify specifically. Um, other things with recording that you have to consider are your devices that you use to record, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. Um, the environment, um, and that's more so related to um, the sky rather than your local environment of around you and landscape wise. And then of course, weather, which is actually more important in the east because they do get storms um, more regularly and fronts, frontal systems moving through. Whereas in the west, um, weather and those big fronts don't impact us in quite the same way. So again, here's more of a zoomed in look at what these calls look like on the spectrogram. Um, the brighter the color, the more yellow, the more intense and loud that sound is. And again, we're just looking at seconds. So you can actually notice at the top, it ranges from 16 to 18.2 about. So we're really only looking at about two, actually I think it's about two and a half seconds of sound recording here. Um, and you can already see there's about six calls at least of different birds in this recording. Um, again, lower down on the image is lower sounds and then higher up you go, um, those higher calls. So recording, recording nocturnal flight calls, you wanna get an image that looks like this. Well, there are so many different ways that you can record nocturnal flight calls, um, which makes it wonderfully um, accessible for most people. And so, for example, most of us carry around an iPhone or Android phone. You can use your smartphone to record, um, which is great. The technology is there for you to be able to just press record, put your phone outside um, and record away. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can go ahead and throw an external mic for anywhere from like 20. You could go for basic with like a video mic me through Rode and just pay like $25, I believe. Um, and stick that on your phone and that'll help um, amplify the sound a little bit, cut down on wind noise um, and just make it a little nice. Or you could go all the way and get a nice shotgun mic and throw a shotgun mic on your phone. Um, either way, uh, lots of different options for using your phone. Then if you wanna step it up and go into a couple hundred dollar range, uh, you can go ahead and use a handheld mic such as a Zoom recorder. And these are really fantastic for actually like capturing and amplifying um, those sounds. Whereas your phone and a phone plus external is not going to amplify it very much, um, that handheld zoom mic uh, is definitely going to help um, capture those sounds that are really far away and higher up. Um, more involved is a flower pot mic where you kind of make it yourself. Um, it's called flower pot because you can literally get a flower pot, which is kind of that dish shape, and stick a mic in the middle, and that'll help bring in um, those little tiny calls from up high. Then the kind of standard microphone for nocturnal flight calls is called the 21C. And this is sort of a fancy flower pot that um, a very well-known and very experienced uh, nocturnal flight call um, expert basically has created and he actually makes these and sells these and his name is Bill Evans. I'll be talking about him a little bit more throughout this presentation um, but he has created this microphone the 21c old bird 21c um, and it's super sensitive and picks up birds like a couple thousand feet up in the sky above you. It's quite amazing and then finally you can go all the way out and buy a couple thousand dollar parabolic mic and um, these microphones are absolutely wonderful at getting those really high quality recordings. Um, some of the spectrograms and some of the recordings I've already shared are from parabolic mics that I've used. Um, I literally just grab the mic and point it straight at the sky. Um, and it's quite fun to do that because you can even hear um, the bird's wing beats. Like if an indigo bunting is flying over, I'm able to hear um, it flapping by, which is just incredible to experience. Um, one downside of the parabolic mic is that it's very directional. And so if you're pointing it at one part of the sky, it's creating sort of um, a very narrow tunnel that's pointed into the sky as well. So I kind of talked about how moon watching, you're only seeing a pinhole of the sky. Well, parabolic mic is kind of doing the same thing, um, but with the sound. And so sure, the quality is like really good and it's really fun, but it's only picking up a narrow portion of the sky. And with all of these, you're not gonna be able to get everything. Um, there's trade-offs between audio quality and how amplified and how good the, the sound is. 
So let's say you're like, all right, I want to record and I'm going to start with my phone. Like, when should I record, especially in Los Angeles? Um, because out in the West, our migration is not quite um, as uh, concentrated and as numerous as the East. Well, like I said, birds are always moving. Um, you could record in June and July and potentially get some cool shorebirds. Um, you could record in the middle of winter and maybe have waterfowl flying over that um, you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And so my recommendation, especially for starting out, um, is definitely focusing on those spring and fall periods and maybe giving it a go and by checking um, BirdCast. Again, I've mentioned this a little bit before, but it's a Cornell tool and they will tell you um, kind of like, oh, this is how many birds are moving. Um, this is the altitude the birds are at, which way the birds are moving. Um, it's really neat and it, it's based on radar technology. And so if you actually kind of look at this image um, in the top right of these graphs, there's birds in flight and nightly average. And you'll actually notice there's a big spike in mid-September that we had. Um, actually on September 11th, we had quite a good movement. I think it was almost 400,000 birds moved through the county, it was the prediction. So there are definitely birds that still move here and birds that call and um, NFC recording here is very exciting. Um, in terms of when to record at night, anywhere after sunset to right before sunrise is, is um, perfect. I generally fall in that kind of 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. range, um, just because that usually captures most of the birds that are moving. Um, but it, if you want to go to bed at 11 p.m., you want to actually sleep, then um, recording whenever after sun, uh, sunset is, is all good. So you recorded your first night. How are you going to visualize um, these recordings? You have the data, but where do you put it? Well, there's actually quite a few different programs that we can use. Um, several of them are free, which is fantastic. I love free uh, software, it's great. So for example, a classic is Audacity, and this is great for visualizing and doing the minimal processing that you need to actually upload these recordings if you'd like to eBird. Another free resource is Raven Lights. It has a little bit more of a learning curve, um, but it's still pretty easy to just drag and drop your files in, see the spectrogram and kind of look at your files. Then we have um, Adobe Audition. So Adobe has a great suite of programs, but it does cost money. And so I personally use Adobe Edition and I love the interface. I love the, um, the way I can set up different keyboard shortcuts, um, but it does cost money. And so if you do have Adobe, I highly recommend Audition. But if you don't wanna pay for a subscription, um, there are student discounts. I highly recommend if you're really interested in Adobe products. But if you just want Audition and you don't wanna pay that, that fee, look into Ocean Audio. Um, last I checked, this is a free software that it's set up just like Audition. Um, it has the same kind of user interface and uh, apparently it's really nice. So Ocean Audio is also a really good option if you really wanna try something like Audition. And then finally, there's this sort of um, older program called Glassofire. And this is a really great way to look at a ton of your recordings at once. And this is more so paired with um, these things called automatic detectors, which will actually detect flight calls for you from recordings on your computer. Um, this is a Windows specific program. Um, it still runs great despite looking like it's out of the early 2000s. Um, I've used it in the past, but for the most part, I just work with Audition on Audacity. Um, just to kind of jump into the weeds really quick, one thing that I often am asked is how do I process and store my calls um, and recordings? Because once you start recording and you get obsessed with it, you can start to amass a lot of recordings, especially based on eBird protocols if you're eBirding your recordings. Um, so I kind of briefly mentioned you can use automatic detectors and it'll pull out um, little like second, like one to two second clips for you and will already have the calls for you. You don't have to worry about going through your recordings. What I personally do um, is I follow eBird protocol and what you're supposed to do when you do an NFC count is make hour long checklists 
um, and record the birds during that hour and the checklist. And then if you're gonna continue on for the night, start a new checklist every hour. It's kind of similar to pelagic protocol um, where you base on um, different features, whereas this is hour long specific protocol. Um, just for file naming, I highly recommend that you, uh, if you really get into this, to make sure that you set up a system early and quickly and make sure you find one that works. I personally find um, that setting up something where you have the year, month, date, and then you either, if you're keeping hour long recordings for your eBird lists, you maybe write down the eBird checklist ID number and then if this is list number one for the night, list number two, something like that. Or if you're keeping um, specific snippets, let's say you get a really nice Swainson's Thrush recording, name it. And then I like to do like SWTH for Swainson's Thrush and then maybe like list three of the night or something like that. So I just highly recommend processing um, and naming your files in a way that is very easy to navigate otherwise it'll get messy quickly. And I know that from experience. Um, in terms of storing, I just put them in like Dropbox. Um, sometimes uh, I'll drop them onto an external hard drive, but they don't take up that much space. Even hour long recordings are, are pretty good. So with actually identifying and classifying these calls, um, we can first kind of jump into just doing so by very large grouping. And so if we look at this image down here on the bottom, we can see that there's kind of like two bands of um, all these like little like yellow marks, which are bird calls. Um, we see that there's a lower one and there's a higher band. And so that lower band is between about two kilohertz and four kilohertz. And this is our thrushes, grosbeaks, tanagers. They all hang out, they're all our calls are down here at two kilohertz to four kilohertz. And this is really helpful if you're like, oh gosh, like I heard a bird, I recorded a bird and it's calls around three kilohertz. I don't know if it's a warbler or if it's a thrush. Well, the nice thing is that we immediately know it's not a warbler because the warblers and sparrows and buntings are generally between that five kilohertz to 10 kilohertz range. So if you have something below that, then very, very likely that it's not a warbler, sparrow, or bunting. And if it's above that, it's probably not a thrush, or speaker, tanager. So now that we've kind of grouped it, these calls, let's talk about looking at the calls individually. And there's two things that I wanna focus on when we look at calls and that's shape and direction. And what I mean by shape, so let's pull up some recordings here. These are in grayscale, these are from Audacity. Um, and if you look, I've kind of labeled these two things modulated and unmodulated. And so modulated, if you see those two, I'm referring to that wavy pattern, um, like the swiggly line. And that's just this oscillation of frequencies that's happening very rapidly, um, less than, than like 100 milliseconds sometimes. So um, it's just this like crazy, really fast oscillation that sounds like, like a buzz to our ears. So we might call these buzz or zeep calls. Then we have um, what we call unmodulated uh, calls, which if you notice, they're like generally made up of these like flat lines. Um, some of them might have multiple lines layered on top of each other, but they're all flat um, or they don't have those like really rapid oscillations. And so those are unmodulated. Then we're going to look at direction of these calls. And what I mean by direction is kind of of like which way they're angled. Are they angled up? Are they angled down? Are they not angled any way? So we can see that uh, flat, very, very descriptive for its, uh, what it is. The, it stays the same pitch, basically the same frequency. Up sweep, we might have this um, little modulated call that's slightly angled upwards. Some calls are way more dramatic than that and they swipe upward very quickly. And then we also have a down sweep. Um, and for example, that's a Savannah Sparrow. Um, which if you've ever heard Savannah Sparrows, they have a very classic two call and that's what they look like. Alrighty, so let's look at some spectrograms and work through an ID real quick here. So we have a spectrogram. We have our time scale on the x-axis up here, ranging from 4.1 seconds up to 5.4. So we're only looking at a second and a half of a recording here. And then on the y-axis, we have that frequency again from low frequency to high frequency. And I wanna point out um, one thing that I often hear from people 
that are kind of discouraged about recording is they live in a super noisy neighborhood um, or they live, let's say you live right next to like a fire station or something even. The nice thing about uh, spectrograms is that it's layered by these frequencies, whereas to our ears, the sirens, the helicopters overlap with the birds and might drown out the sound for us, we can still see the sound um, unobstructed. So you can see like down low, that might be like the hum of the 210 outside my, outside my house, but thankfully um, the bird calls are just fine. So we can kind of look at our groups. Here's our two to four kilohertz range. Nothing's there. There's no bright colors, no um, calls that I see, just a bunch of like um, noise basically. So I know I don't have any thrushes that I'm dealing with in this recording, thrushes, gross beaks, tanagers, et cetera. All of our birds are above that, which tells me probably warblers, some buntings, uh, maybe a sparrow or two. So let's look at the shape of a couple of these calls. Um, so these two big bright ones are these kind of squiggly, uh, squiggly calls, which again, we call modulated. And then uh, we'll go ahead and look at one call all the way over here on the left, which is our unmodulated. And you'll notice that it's just kind of that straight line. And I've kind of included the um, direction in these two. So I have the shape modulated or just this um, unmodulated. And then if they're rising or not. And so if you look at the two left ones, they're both slightly rising, whereas the one on the right, completely flat. So now what? <laughs> you've got your shape, you've got your um, direction. What do we do with that? Well, we identify them, um, unless you don't want to, that's okay. But uh, there are a ton of resources for identifying bird, uh, these nocturnal flight calls, which is amazing because even just five years ago, there were not this many resources and not this many people interested. So you really had to kind of like search the depths of the internet for one or two references for, uh, let's say you're recording, you're like, oh, that was like a really good warbler. Like, let me find a recording of this warbler. And there's like one really bad recording and you're just like, no, I don't know what it is. Um, so we have a few different resources. Again, I'll mention Glevin's with Old Bird. He has an amazing um, collaborative resource that he put together with Michael O'Brien, which covers so many different species. Um, there's this blog that this um, independent birder put together, which affectionately referred to as the PJDI blog. So I'm not exactly sure what that reference is, but um, it's a fantastic resources uh, for listening and looking at different recordings. There's a brand new website um, that a good friend of mine actually just created called nocturnalflightcalls.com. Very easy to remember. And that includes a ton of species, which is really great because um, once again, the West Coast gets kind of left out of um, everything that's happening with nocturnal flight calls. So this is a really good resource for a few more of those Western species. There's also the Rosetta Stone specifically for warblers, which is a pretty cool little infographic. There's a ton of Facebook groups. Well, more so only a couple of Facebook groups, but quite a few people interested in um, nocturnal flight calls. And of course, some really wonderful local um, online guides such as Andy's NFC cheat sheet for LA County, which um, again, the West is often uh, left out of these things. And this is a very invaluable resource um, for uh, the, the birds here specifically. So let's pull that one uh, call out from the right side of our recording. I've taken down a few um, different numbers. And so we already ruled out thrushes, tanagers, gross beaks. And so let's see, let's look at some of these numbers I wrote down. So I put down 0 0.147 seconds. I literally just clicked and dragged and measured um, how long this call was, which is 147 milliseconds. Um, so about a 10th of a second, very short. I then look at the y-axis for those kilohertz numbers, and it's about six and a half to nine, nine and a half kilohertz. Um, so it's that higher range, so warbler, bunting, or sparrow. And I wrote down this number eight to 10 modulations. And what I mean by that is that I'm physically counting the little tiny like bumps on this call that I'm able to see. Sometimes if the recording is not good enough, you can't see that, but here we can actually count. Um, there's eight, 10 sort of little bumps here. And so we can quickly look at the Rosetta Stone um, and see that most of the warblers that show these bumps on their calls or modulation um, don't have that many bumps on their call uh, or they're rising or they just don't look right. So 
really briefly, we can tell this is not a warbler. We can go through that. And for Los Angeles County specifically, a lot of these are not going to apply very commonly. You never know, but yeah. So let's go to the old bird resource and let's look into sparrows and buntings. So I pulled up the old bird website, that resource that I talked about that has this wonderful collaborative project. And if you click on the sparrows or warblers and you click on a bird that has a buzz call, it'll actually pull up a page called buzz calls or they're also referred to zeeps. And you can see that uh, Bill has kind of um, separated this. So we have two sparrows, Lincoln's and Swamp Sparrow. We have a bunch of different warblers and then we have a few buntings, grosbeak, sticks, whistles. If you'll notice, um, there's no lazuli bunting, but <laughs> that's okay. They're pretty much the same as indigo bunting. So let's look at the sparrows real quick. Lincoln's and swamp sparrows are very similar. We can look at the length. The length looks pretty good. Um, the kilohertz, the frequency range is, uh, is like right spot on, but we're noticing that the modulation, those little bumps, there's a ton of them in Lincoln swamp sparrow and they're like, really small humps versus this really dramatic uh, look on our mystery bird. So it's not a sparrow. Those are the only two sparrows that have a zeep. It's not those. So let's look into our buntings and grosbeaks and even dixisle. So here's indigo bunting, blue grosbeak, dixisle. Let's kind of go through the numbers. Indigo bunting 0.087 to 0.14. That's about right. 5.3 to 9.7 gigahertz. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really fitting in with our mystery bird. And six to 12 modulations. Wow, that's like perfect. Um, let's just double check the other ones to see. Blue grosbeak, we're 0.08 to 0.15, very similar to indigo bunting length, that does fit. Um, however, it's four to about eight and a half kilohertz, which is a little bit too low for what we're dealing with here. And then finally, we'll just check Dixisle. And we can see that it's at two and a half to seven kilohertz range, which is way too low for our mystery bird. So based on what we've narrowed down, our bird is an indigo bunting. Um, for the West, this could be lazuli bunting. They pretty much sound almost identical. Um, but I know specifically this bird was reported in the East, which is an indigo bunting. But that's kind of how I would walk through an identification that I'm not sure about. Um, you can learn these by ear and get pretty good at them pretty fast. So in summary, nocturnal flight calls, backyard accessible, even if you're living next to the freeway, it's all okay, you can still record. Um, you can record whenever, birds are always moving. And the cool thing about it is that nocturnal flight and migration is heavily understudied. And there's so many new things that we're learning. Um, and that might be daunting and a little scary, but being on the West Coast, it's kind of this whole new frontier of we don't know what's going on. Um, and there's new things that we're finding every day. And I just wanna kind of remind that we cannot identify everything. We can't see the birds, we can hear them. So trying to find that gap between what the bird looks like that's giving that call can be a little challenging. Um, and of course, just have fun with it. Uh, I've included a few little resource links here in case you wanna see what the actual web URL looks like for some of these um, websites that I've mentioned. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have for the nocturnal flight calls tonight. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let me yeah, thank you so much, Marky. Fantastic. No um, we have some questions. And you know, please, if you have questions, put it in the uh, QA. And um one question um Sequoia asks, are are these night calls audible without a high power microphone? Yes, yeah, you can definitely um, hear these birds with your own ears, uh, which is the really nice thing. Um, it can be a little challenging to just hear it um, on your own if you live in a very noisy area, because unfortunately we are not computers and able to separate those frequencies. Um, so the sirens and helicopters might uh, prove a little challenging to hear birds. Um, but the other thing that I will mention for hearing birds, if you want to like try go out and hear nocturnal flight calls um, is on a cloudy night when there's lower clouds because that'll keep the birds lower and closer. So they'll be a little more audible. 
Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that's actually interesting is that most people will think, oh, you want to go somewhere that's um, really remote and rural and maybe um, more quiet and darker, and maybe you'll hear the birds better that way. Um, well, there's actually a fine balance there because um, light pollution is actually really bad for birds migrating because it disorients them. Um, but the thing for nocturnal fly calls is it actually brings the birds closer. Um, so you will hear more birds where there's more city lights. Um, so it's kind of like yeah. a weird trade off. Cool. That's it. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, we have some questions in the in the chat. Lance asks for hour long recordings, especially in wave format. The file sizes can be quite large. What sampling rate do you use? A 60 minute recording sampled at 48 kilohertz will exceed the maximum size that eBird allows. Yes. Um, so I will break up that recording. Um, so I'll, I'll store an hour long recording on um, like Dropbox or on an external hard drive where I have it labeled. But what I'll go do for eBird to upload to eBird is I'll go through and pull little snippets um, from that recording and save them as their own. Um, and I highly recommend if you end up doing something like that, that you leave at least a couple seconds of silence um, or just the, the noise, the background noise before and after the call rather than a like a one second clip um, because it just makes it easier for listening um, for our own purposes and then also for identification. Having um, even just this blank noise uh, is a good context. So yeah, the, the file sizes, um, compared to like photography are a lot smaller um, and easier to store, but yeah, you can't, sometimes they might exceed um, the eBird. So I highly recommend cutting them down a little bit and just storing the full clip somewhere else. Great, Great thank you. Um, I have a question from Yvonne who asks, uh, any interference from migrating insects? Do they vocalize while migrating? Hmm, hmm interesting. I've never encountered um, insects that are moving overhead, calling and interfering. Um, but especially in the fall, crickets um, are really, really annoying um, because they can definitely overlap with um, <laughs> some birds. So uh, if you get like a, it doesn't really happen here that much from my very limited experience, but if you get a cool night and it kind of shuts up the insects, then you're like, yay. <laughs> um, but yes, crickets can definitely impact um, some of your recordings a little bit. Oh, great. I have a <laughs> nocturnal helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's one outside yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the same one. We're not that far apart. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, Yvonne asks, uh, sorry, this isn't about uh, nocturnal flight calls, but about spotting birds against the moon. Is there a calculation to determine the altitude of a rising or setting moon, given that the altitude you mentioned was up to 5,000 feet uh, in altitude? Yeah, so I personally haven't done much with calculating, um, like, the bird's height or anything, but I do know that people are able to actually set up three cameras and triangulate on birds flying over. Mm. And they're able to um, better guess kind of like where the bird is in physical space. So I know there's ways to do it. Um, and there's also ways to set up automated moon watching where it actually um, has a little motor that like moves your scope and follows the moon. Um, so I know there's ways to kind of work through that um, out there, but I've never done it. Yeah. Andy, right. uh, can you come back online? Um, you have an interesting comment and... I was just wondering, because Mark is more in tune with what people do as research these days, but um, I, I think Bill Evans had sort of done some research on like the radio TV towers that have these red lights and... Mm -hmm high fatalities or something that birds were drawn in. I, I was just reading something recently, I think LA Times had something on um, how LA City has recently, you know, installed LED lighting to save energy and reduce carbon emissions, you know, all a noble worthy cause, but I think LED, LED lighting creates far more light pollution mm 
than um, the regular lighting. And I was just kind of wondering if you've got a sense that out there in the research world, whether students, PhD students were investigating whether LED was causing any more sort of night dizziness, fatalities, et cetera, or uh, at all, yeah. kind of curious. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I don't know anyone personally doing work on that, um, but I do know from doing window strike monitoring that I try to note down one is the window that the bird struck um, did it have a light on behind it and two what type of light it was and I did find that rooms with LEDs I mean it's super anecdotal but they had a very high rate of hits um, so it's hard to say for sure I don't know anyone personally who's doing that right now I'm sure there is someone um, but I, I don't know for sure yeah and, and so just as a follow up to that, then, you, you know, in terms of sort of the, you know, the, they have these sort of campaigns of lights out in the cities, which I don't think LA has adopted yet, which seems yeah. strange for a progressive city. But um, I feel like Chicago and some of the Midwestern cities have adopted this lights out. And presumably that does have an impact on reducing bird fatalities. And I didn't know if you had a point of view or a feeling about that at all. Yeah, it helps a lot. Um, I've been a part of a few smaller lights out um, programs. So I did a lot of window monitoring when I was at LSU. And we actually did um, lights out campaigns at LSU. And then also kind of, um, I would work with sometimes a couple of librarians because the big window strike um, building on campus was a library because it was open 24 hours. And mm. We had multiple floors with big windows. And I would actually work to go and close the blinds at least to like black out the lights. Um, and I know that those um, have been super effective uh, in helping yeah. reduce strikes. Just turning out lights um, is super, super helpful for these migrating birds. I've actually had um, buildings where the, like all the offices are turned off, no lights, and then one person leaves a desk light on and there will be like an oven bird that struck the window outside that. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. It feels like lab and maybe in collaboration with LA Audubon Society we ought to put a bit of pressure on LA yeah. City on doing lights out. I think, you know, downtown is all these office buildings, 30 floors up, all lit up yeah. for no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and there is obviously a lot of migration going on at night that people are unaware of. Yeah. Definitely. And dead birds found next morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. Also in the uh, in the chat, Lance mentions, or I mean, maybe Lance, since you're on, maybe you can say something about your yeah. autonomous recording unit. Go ahead, Lance. Lance. Yeah. So, hi, Marky. Um, so last spring, I put out a, a song meter mini autonomous recording unit on along the Mount Wilson Road for about two months in the hope of recording some owls, and it did. But I also checked for nocturnal flight calls and there weren't very many um and it recorded all night there were some swains and thrushes a couple of other things that might have been white crowned sparrows and some other stuff a couple of things i didn't know but surprisingly little i i really thought there would be uh a lot more and so that brings to mind my my question right after that which is have you put out recorders at bear divide at night and what have you found and how do the numbers compare with the birds flying in the morning? Mm -hmm. So we have not yet, um, but we've done a couple just um, camping trips to see if we can physically hear them. And we find that Bear Divide is very devoid of nocturnal calls. Yeah. Um, and so one thing is that um, maybe these birds are really just drawn to the city with the lights and the lower um, basin. And maybe they're kind of straying away from these higher mountains. Um, but the other thing that has kind of come up, especially, um, I kind of mentioned this nocturnal visible migration. So in Cape May, they're doing these spotlighting photography, and they're finding that they're seeing a ton of birds at night that are not calling at all. Um, they wouldn't know that the birds were there unless they were literally shining lights on them um, to yeah. see them. So uh, maybe there is a lot of migration that's happening over the mountains that we just can't hear um so yeah. that's where thermal scope might come into play or something like that but or radar or radar yeah and the issue with the mountains is getting the radar in there is so tricky but 
we could have a a local smaller setup with radar would be really cool i haven't checked but uh birdcast doesn't cover local mountains i take it mm -mm. it's just the county level so there's another uh question not related to nfc's but you mentioned you do research with birds as an undergrad how did you get involved with this I think yeah. this is from someone who wants to be uh, wants to do the same thing as my guest. <laughs> oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I knew uh, in high school when I was applying to colleges that I really wanted to work in a museum. And so before I actually applied, I reached out to a bunch of curators and just sent them cold emails. I was like, hey, I'm a high school student who wants to do bird research, um, kind of face that fear of reaching out to these like big names and just emailed them and asked them, would they have any, if I went to school there, would they potentially have the time and the resources to bring me on? Um, and that helped me decide the school that I wanted to go to. Um, LSU had the, the best response. They were like, oh yeah, like we can set up a project and all these wonderful things. Um, <laughs> so that really helped me choose. Uh, but if you're currently in undergrad and you're at an institution, you're not sure how to proceed, I highly recommend looking into um, professors who maybe are teaching classes that you're really interested in um, and just talking to them and seeing, uh, letting them know, hey, I'm really interested in bird research. And let's say the professor teaches a genetics class or genomics class, or even just a basic biology. And you're like, I really like this part of biology, or I really like genomics, and I want to do more and I want to kind of focus on birds with it. Um, so my biggest, my biggest advice is don't be scared to reach out and ask. Um, that's, that's what has gotten me into these positions that allow me to do research is sticking my neck out and seeing um, if someone has the time to take on someone who has the passion. Sure. And that's what professors are there for. They, that's what they live to do. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, Beth asks, are, do you have any there was an insect question before. Do you have any interference with bats? Oh, ah, yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So they don't, <laughs> they, <laughs> so I say, oh my goodness, because the bats thankfully are much higher, but they are loud sometimes. Um, and if you're like live listening, so live listening is where you're listening to um, your microphone as it's recording. Um, and you can do that through plugging in the microphone to your computer, what records, and then plugging your headphones into your computer and listening. And if the bats get really close, oh, it can, it can hurt your ears a little bit. So um, I haven't done very much here in LA County um, in terms of recording. So I don't know what the bats here are quite like, um, but in like Missouri and um, the other LA, Louisiana, the bats sometimes would be really annoying. You're just like, you have to take out your headphones and you're like, oh, bats. But um, you can actually identify bats based on their calls too, which is really cool. And there's automatic detectors that'll identify them for you too, which is pretty cool. Awesome. Um, let's see, Yvonne asks, uh, the person uh, photographing migrating birds at night that you showed in your introduction is using a, a strobe or flash. Could this momentarily disorient the bird that's being mm. photographed? Yeah, so um, really good question because I mean, these birds that are already migrating, like they're already facing so many perils. It's like, we don't wanna do anything that'll potentially um, disorient them more. And the good thing is that, so when they're doing these spotlighting, um, they're actually a team of um, the people who are doing this are um, very experienced researchers who have a lot of experience um, paying attention to the fine um, behavioral cues of birds. And so um, I've heard that so far it does not impact the birds in any way at all. Um, what the specific protocol that they do is they actually have a thermal scope where they find the bird and they have these spotlights that they shine on the bird and follow the bird as it flies by and then people photograph them. Um, and what I've heard uh, from photographing things that are tiny, like warblers, all the way up to even like owls, um, which there's a lot of uh, controversy, like don't using flash on owls. Um, and like, I totally agree. Like we wanna make sure that we're minimizing our impact on these birds. Um, and from what I've heard um, so far from these people um, who do this is that the birds are unfazed. They're completely unfazed. They continue on their migratory path. Um, they don't approach the light, they don't approach the people um, who are taking photos, 
So supposedly um, the birds are, are doing fine with that, but that's a really good thing to consider when um, already, already looking into something that is a very critical moment of a bird's uh, life cycle. Great, thank you. Um, oh, uh, John says that in May 13th, 2021, he used a <coughs> thermal scope at Bear Divide and saw only a few nocturnal migrants, could not ID any. Um, most interesting was one heading south. Oh, cool. I'm glad that Flip there was down. some thermal scope usage at Bear Divide. That's really good to hear. Cool. I. Any more questions? I've got one. Um, so, you know, there's been a considerable interest in the Merlin Sound ID app. How does it do with West Coast nocturnal flight calls? Yes. It has not been trained for that yet. So I will say that it's um, not good right now. Um, I know that they are uh, doing a very heavy training session with nocturnal flight calls in general right now. Um, but from my understanding, it is very... Um, heavily biased towards the east because that's where they have the most resources right now. Yeah. Um, the more recordings we have uh, that we're able to identify and the more that we upload them to eBird, uh, the more likely that they'll be able to train the AI to better identify um, Western birds, so. And at the recent WFO uh, conference, when we had our so our bird sound competition, team competitions, the Merlin team, who was only using Merlin, did not do well. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully uh, the AI next year will be in much better shape. Yeah. It does. It does amazing in Eastern birds, but it. Yeah, it has a long way to go, but it's it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Anyone has? I guess not. Marky, thank you very very much for a wonderful webinar. We everyone I think really enjoyed it. And there were lots of comments I noticed in the chat thanking you uh, for a wonderful webinar. Yes, and thank you. It was great. Very thank you very so well much. Presented. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, learned a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, there's, I, I always present things like this and I always think of like a million other things that I could add on. So <laughs> there's so much, <laughs> no, there's so much to talk fantastic. about and learn, so. Well, that's okay. Well, that, we, that means that means we have to have you back sometime. <laughs> Absolutely, a part two. There we go. <laughs> and uh, for everyone else, uh, I'm looking forward to next month's webinars on, uh, on um, bird bird names and uh, and pelagic mammals. And speaking of pelagic, uh, if you haven't yet, go ahead and sign up for our wait list for the twenty fourth pelagic trip. Um, the you can sign up uh, off the original email you receive from LA Birders. And if you don't have that, simply send us a message at info at labirders .org and we'll get one out to you. And with that, thank you again, Marky. Um, we will, we really appreciate it. And I will see everyone out in the field or at next webinar. Or both. Thank you so much. Or both. <laughs> Take and care. Both. Thank you, Marky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.